Copyright Essentials for Student Authored Works, presented by Peter Midgley, whom I'll introduce in just a moment. My name is Clark Iacovacus. I'm Scholarly Services Librarian at Oklahoma State University, and I am one of the board members for the Texas Electronic Thesis and Dissertation Association, or as we call it, Texeda. Thanks so much for joining us today. We're really excited to have you here, and we're looking forward to this talk. A few words first about Texeda. We're founded in 2009, so we're in our 10th year now. Uh, Texeda, our mission is to provide a network of support for ETD professionals, uh, and that's graduate school, uh, administrators, librarians, archivists, anyone who does work with electronic theses and dissertations. Uh, it's free to join Texeda, and it's open to anyone. You don't have to live in Texas to join. You can subscribe to our listserv at that hyperlink, and if you don't want to type that in, just go to tuxeda.org and click on the outreach uh, button and click on join the listserv from there. A few logistical items before we start. All of the attendees are muted to prevent background noise. We welcome questions and we hope that you have a lot of them. Um, we're going to have a Q&A session following the pre presentation, but you can answer, you can enter questions at any time. And the way to do that is uh, if you click on your screen, you should see a panel open at the bottom and just click on the blue chat bubble and it will open up the chat window. So that panel will fade away if you're not active for a while. So just click on the screen in order for it to appear again. The setting on that when you click on it should be set at all panelists and uh, please just leave it there and that will come to all of us uh, panelists. Also, this webinar is being recorded and you will receive a uh, email afterwards uh, with links to the recording as well as the presentation slides. Now I'm going to welcome our speaker, Peter Midgley. Peter is the director of the Copyright Licensing Office at Brigham Young University. Before coming to work at BYU, he practiced intellectual property law for 15 years at law firms in California and Idaho. Mr. Midgley is a registered patent attorney with a Juris Doctor degree from George Washington University and a Bachelor of Science degree in Electrical and Computer Engineering from BYU. He presents frequently on copyright topics, especially those confronting educators and librarians, as well as other intellectual property topics, including patents and trademarks. We thank you so much, Peter, and we're going to turn it over to you at this point. Thanks so much uh, for that introduction, Clark. Let me uh, uh, share my screen here and we can get underway. Uh, hopefully everybody can see that. Um, yeah, so um, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to, um, to talk to this group about um, copyright issues that we confront when dealing with student authored works. Um, as Clark mentioned, I, I've been the director of the BYU Copyright Licensing Office for the past five years or so. And uh, in that capacity, we encounter at, at universities a very wide range of copyright issues um, from a number of different categories of works. Uh, certainly faculty created works uh, create, create some interesting challenges, uh, third party we, works that we need to use on campus. Um, you know, there's a, as those of you who work at universities understand, there, there are a, a very wide variety of copyright issues that we confront in university settings, but the focus for today will be on copyright issues that we encounter when dealing with works that have been authored by our students. Um, uh, first things first, just um, the, the necessary legal mumbo jumbo here. I, as Clark mentioned, I am an attorney, but um, I am not representing anybody in this particular uh, presentation. So even though we're addressing legal principles um, that apply here in the United States and I'm giving general legal information, it's not specific legal advice and the principles we're discussing may not apply in all countries. And the views that are being uh, expressed here do not represent necessarily represent the views of either BYU or Texeda. So with that, um, I want to begin by kind of setting the stage with what is arguably one of the most famous or uh, valuable student authored works um, in recent memory. 
So um, this this case involves the creation of Facebook, which was a which was developed originally at Harvard University. Um, as indicated here in the early 2000s, there were some Harvard students, uh, Tyler and Cameron Winklevoss and Divya Narendra, um, who developed this idea, the basic idea behind a social networking site for college students. Um, they entered into, or they allege that they entered into this verbal agreement with their classmate, Mark Zuckerberg, and who, was, who had uh, proficiency as a software developer. Uh, so uh, originally, Mark Zuckerberg, according to the Winklevosses and Narendra, uh, was not the original idea guy. He was the guy that was implementing their idea. Um, but um, as many of you probably know, in 2004, Mark Zuckerberg launched Facebook. And when they learned about what he had done, they went to visit uh, the university president, uh, Larry Summers. Now, uh, when I gave this presentation in person, I would play a little clip from the movie, The Social Network, which is a great film made in 2010. But uh, due to technical limitations, I just grabbed a screenshot here. Um, so this uh, is a scene from the movie. I highly encourage everybody to go watch this movie. It's a great movie about um, the development of Facebook. Um, but the, the two gentlemen seated on the left there, those are the Winklevoss twins, uh, or the actors depicting the Winklevoss twins, I should say. And as, as part of this scene, they, they say to the university president, the idea is worth potentially millions of dollars. And uh, Larry Summers, who was a former um, Treasury Secretary for the United States, the president of Harvard University, says, millions? You might just be letting your imaginations run away with you, <laughs> which, um, of course, is... Uh, ironic um, given what Facebook went on to become. So he, um, much to the uh, Winklevoss's disappointment, they did not get any kind of um, redress from the university. They um, he, Basically the president of Harvard referred them to the court system. Uh, so they went to the courts and in 2004, they filed a, a lawsuit against uh, Zuckerberg and Facebook um, and in 2008, that case settled for a reported valuation of $65 million, which again highlights how wrong the, the Harvard University president was about the potential valuation for Facebook. Uh, this, uh, this case, um, I, I think, just sets the stage for the fact that, you know, many of us work at institutions where we have incredibly bright people uh, who are students and, um, uh, another aspect of that scene, which I didn't show, it, when when the university president is is kind of chastising these boys for being in his office, he tells them to go off and find a new project, um, and you know they they're very disappointed, like he he's re asking them to go work on a new diorama for the science fair, um, and I I think as university employees and administrators, sometimes we look at our students, you know, this rising generations, and we kind of look down our noses at the work that they produce and don't really fully appreciate its value. Um, that certainly was the case in this instance. And, you know, if you think about the work that you do with students, um, is it possible that there are student works at your own institution that have a lot more value than you're giving credence to? Um, it's it's a good reminder for those of us who sit in these uh, positions to to not downplay the significance of the student authored works that may be created on our campuses. Okay, so um, we're just going to take a little, a very very quick uh, tour of the foundations of copyright law before we get into sp some specific use cases. So uh, the the foundations in the United States for copyright come from the Constitution, uh, the founders. Um, you know, the Constitution is very short. It doesn't have a lot in it, but it does include in Article 1, Section 8, this uh, clause where the founders specifically authorized Congress to promote the progress of science and the useful arts by securing for limited times um, exclusive rights to uh, writings and discoveries. Uh, so from this clause, we, we get the modern copyright statute. Um, there are basically eight categories of works that are protectable in copyright. So, and they're very broad categories. So literary works, anything textual in nature, musical works, uh, dramatic works, um, choreography is protectable. And we've actually um, 
that's not the focus of today, but just you may be interested to, to know that there's been a, an uptick in uh, choreographic based copyright claims in in courts recently. And um, certainly here at BYU, and I suspect at many institutions, you may have uh, a dance department for whom choreographic works would be important category. Um, uh, continuing on with the remainder of these categories, uh, there are, of course, uh, pictorial uh, works, motion pictures, sound recordings, and architectural works. And we'll, as we go through this presentation, we're going to highlight uh, case studies and examples that will touch on various of these categories. So this is what co copyright covers. What copyright does not cover um, expressly are the, the items that are shown here on the screen. So uh, words and short phrases, um, you know, I gave the example there of just do it. That's uh, obviously a very famous trademark that's owned by Nike, uh, but that there's not enough text there to qualify for copyright protection. Uh, blank forms. Again, not protectable uh, ideas themselves before they are expressed in a tangible medium are not um, protectable. Uh, again, this was an issue in the in the Facebook case when the Winklevosses have their idea. It's one thing to have an idea. It's a different thing to uh, express it in a in a tangible medium. And that's the expression of the idea is what's protectable through copyright. Um, uh, calendars, height and weight charts, rulers, these are all things not protectable. And in the United States, a typeface is not protectable. Um, we get a lot of questions around fonts. Um, a lot of times fonts are implemented through computer code, which is protectable, but the typeface itself is not a protectable um, element through copyright law. So, um, I, I, uh, again, as Clark mentioned, I, I also have a background in patents and trademarks and a lot of the questions that come to our office, uh, people use uh, copyright uh, almost synonymously with patents and trademarks and hopefully everybody uh, listening understands that these are very, very distinct legal concepts. Um, and even though they are, uh, shall we say, cousins, um, the, the differences between them can be very significant. So uh, it, it ranges all the way from the length of term that works are protected, the the remedies that are available to people who protect them, the rights that owners of a patent have versus the owners of a copyright, very different. So um, just to be clear, we're limiting our conversation here to the copyright uh, issues that arise in connection with our student authored works. Uh, there can be very important patent and trademark issues also, but those are beyond the scope of this particular presentation. Okay, so the first case study I want to highlight, uh, aside from the Facebook one, is this uh, Tenth Circuit case. Um, and when I, I, I want to focus on this one, even though it doesn't come from a university specifically, um, this image that you're seeing, you may notice the copyright symbol in the lower left-hand corner of the screen there. Uh, this image is... Uh, was registered as a copyright and somebody was using it um, in a training setting. Um, and so the the author of the image, the one who created the image, filed a lawsuit. And it begs the question, is there enough creativity here? If the if the three words just do it aren't enough to warrant copyright protection, you know, there aren't that many words shown on the screen here. Is it protectable as a literary work? Is there enough text there to protect it? How about as a um, a, as an illustration, as you know, as an artistic work? Um, and the court, when it went through the analysis, said that there is creative, protectable creative insight in the arrangement and choice of expression, and it pushes this diagram into the realm of copy copyrightability. Again, I want to I, I wanted to just give this as an example because I think it highlights the fact that you don't really need all that much. Uh, this um, this is not a, a great work of literature or uh, the Mona Lisa, but it, it is enough to be protectable through US copyright law. Um, a, another case, uh, again, in the same area that, that it does arise from a university dispute uh, involved two professors at Northwestern University and a graduate student working for one of the professors published these uh, charts that you're seeing here and the equations that underlie the data in uh, her master's thesis. And then uh, a colleague of her um, 
her mentor, basically her her thesis uh, advisor, um, Taflov, used these equations and these figures in an article that he was publishing. And so this this involved the very uncomfortable situation where you had two colleagues at the same university, uh, you know, one of whom was suing the other one. Um, so hopefully none of you have had the misfortune of dealing with a situation where you have two faculty members uh, in a dispute so so significant that they're suing each other, but that's what happened here. And the court had an occasion to consider whether these figures were eligible for copyright pr uh, protection or the, the mathematical equations um, behind the figures were sufficient and the court said no, this, this is not enough. Um, the, the representation here, if you're wondering, well, why in the previous slide, I'm just going to back up real quick, why is this one enough to warrant copyright protection, whereas these are not enough? Um, it, it related to the idea that uh, the, the most obvious thing that might have been protectable here were, were the equations, and equations, um, though, though they may be quite elegant, as a former engineer, I can tell you that, um, you know, Lots of engineers and mathematicians are very fond of equations, but they don't represent creative, original works of authorship that are uh, eligible for copyright protection. And then the graphs, when when you chart out the equations and and graph them, um, that's that's just data that's not protectable by copyright. So in this instance, the the professor who used these equations and these graphs without permission was um, the court basically allowed that to happen because the chart, the, the graphs and the equations were not eligible for protection. Okay, as we continue on our, our tour of copyright uh, basics, the, the term of copyright can be a little tricky to determine because of a, a significant shift in the law that happened in the 1970s. So the current copyright statute that we live in now went into effect on January 1st, 1978. And the easiest way to, to consider whether or not a particular work is in copyright is to divide. The first thing you should do is consider whether it was published before 1978 or not. Um, and um, as we'll see later, what it means for a work to be published can be a, a little bit tricky. Um, but uh, if if a work was published before 1978, it basically enjoys 95 years of protection. Um, if it was published after that, or it was never published, um, so you might have lab notebooks or other things that you are not considered published, then the term is measured in this different way, where it's the life of the author plus 70 years or 120 years after the creation of the work. Um, so after the term has run, uh, works enter the public domain. Um, as many of you probably know, uh, for many years, well, for decades really, because of this shift which happened in 1978, works that had been published in 1923 remained in copyright for a very, very long period of time. And in January, um, just just over a month ago, those works finally, after decades of uh, being locked into copyright protection, entered the public domain. And now, from this point going forward, uh, every new every January first, you can expect a new year's worth of copyrighted works to enter the public domain. Another category of public domain works are those that are created by the United States government. So, um, you know, in our areas, you you might think of uh, NASA works or uh, works uh, research published by federal agencies, um, th those those tend to enter um, into our, uh, you know, the work that we do at universities quite a bit. So if you're if you have students that are dealing with any of that kind of work, uh, that's the public domain. They're free to use it. They don't need to get anybody's permission, and um, and you can not worry about copyright. Okay, so we've now covered what is protected by copyright. The next topic is what are the rights that are enjoyed by the people who um, who own the copyrights? And there are six of them. And uh, so here we have them represented. The first of the exclusive rights is the right to reproduce the work. Um, the second is to prepare adaptations. So we have this represented as a as a book 
being converted into a movie, for example, uh, or a, uh, a translation is another example where you need um, the copyright holder um, is the one who has to grant permission for that to occur. Um, di distribution of copies of the work is, an, is a third exclusive right. Uh, public performance of the work is the fourth, public display, the fifth, and then there's this very limited uh, sixth right that applies only to um, digital audio transmission. So when you pr publicly perform sound recordings on your campus, the sound recording itself, um, you, you are free to perform without uh, copyright uh, permission. Now the musical composition, uh, you do need permission for, but if you're doing it through a digital audio transmission, like, so think of thing, services like Spotify or Pandora, those kinds of services, um, and there's been a lot of litigation recently. That's what that, that relates to. If you want a quick uh, acronym to remember these by, the one we use in our office is RAP Triple D here. Uh, there you see it, reproduction, adaptation, public performance, distribution, display, and digital audio transmission of sound recordings. Okay, so uh, applying these basic principles, here's another case involving a graduate student at Tufts who, um, th this was an art, um, art history student, I believe. Um, Anyway, his his uh, mentor was this artist Joseph Stapleton, who passed away, and uh, almost as a tribute to his um, his mentor, he decided to write his master's thesis on uh, Stapleton. He uh, the student went to receive permission from the heirs uh, of Stapleton and was given full access to all of Stapleton's you know drawings and and uh, personal effects. And so this is a Stapleton image that's shown on the left here, just as an example. But um, what happened is there there was a falling out between the student and the um, the heirs who uh, felt like they should have editorial control over the content of the thesis. And um, so to clear the air, the student filed this lawsuit as a way to demonstrate that they were free to use these works in whatever way uh, they wanted to. Um, I, I wanted to uh, highlight this case as a way to illustrate the, the exclusive rights because even if you are in physical possession of a bunch of, of art in this example, uh, being in physical possession of it does not convey the right to reproduce or distribute. Those are separate copyright interests that are held by a copyright holder and may need to be separately licensed. So, um, you know, for those of us who work in in um, university libraries where we have uh, vast collections of very unique items, the fact that we are the repository that has physical possession of those items does not confer copyright interests. Those travel separately and um, that can be confusing for students who are maybe working in our special collections and referencing those rare things uh, to remember that just because they're getting it from our library doesn't mean that they have copyright permission to use it however they want. Um, here's another very recent example. This was just filed in November. Um, and it highlights a different exclusive right. So in this case, it, uh, Donald Mariski is a former UCLA professor. He developed this um, medication adherence scale, which basically is a series of questions that were posed to, um, to patients to ask, uh, to um, determine how um, faithfully they were taking medications. So uh, a couple of grad students, Linda Park and Selena Kuo, uh, were using those questions as part of research studies they were conducting, at, which were then later published. I've got a, a, a Selena Kuo's article uh, photo, uh, pictured here. And uh, they had their, um, Mariski's company, MMAS Research, has a very extensive licensing program in place um, for licensing out the use of these questions. Um, and, and so it's, uh, the, the students had obtained a license for a limited period of time and the, what's being alleged in this complaint, again, it just filed in November, so we'll have to see where, what the court decides or how the University of California decides to respond to this. 
Uh, what's being alleged, though, is that the students exceeded the scope of the license that they obtained for the use of these questions. So um, again, this is an interesting one because they, uh, which if you think about uh, which of the exclusive rights that were in play here, it was the reproduction of the questions, the distribution of the questions to the subjects of their study um, that's being alleged as the acts of copyright infringement here. Uh, the publication um, itself was was not the problem. It was the work that they were doing that's documented in these in these articles that they published. So again, a couple of cases that illustrate um, where you can potentially run afoul of the exclusive rights that are held by copyright holders. Okay, we get lots and lots of questions about plagiarism when we're dealing with student authored works and oftentimes they get conflated with copyright issues. So I just wanted to take a quick moment to talk about how those two concepts are related because they really are quite distinct. So um, in general, plagiarism relates to providing attribution to source materials and copyright relates to getting permission when you need it to use the works. So typically plagiarism is governed by um, honor codes and uh, it's enforced at academic institutions and copyright, um, as we saw in the Zuckerberg case, that you, you don't go to your university president to, to resolve your copyright dispute. You go instead to the United States federal courts. Um, so um, this is, a, 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 again, if we were in a live setting, I would, we'd be doing this interactively, but just for the purpose of illustration, uh, we're gonna talk about what's the correct relationship between um, plagiarism and copyright and to set the stage i here's the simple example right lollipops and candy which of these is the correct relationship um and it's obviously b uh because all lollipops are candy but not all candy are lollipops right uh, lollipops are a subset of candy okay now if taking that same principle and applying it to the concept of copyright infringement and plagiarism which of these represents the right relationship are they, is one a subset of the other? Is there some overlap between them? Are they totally distinct? Do they never overlap? The answer here is C. And I'll, we'll go through each of these uh, areas and explain how it works. Okay, so the part that the that two share, right? This is when you are both plagiarizing and committing copyright infringement when you're using somebody's work without their permission and you're passing it off as your own. So, you know, when a student is cheating off of their neighbor uh, and the neighbor doesn't know that that, that the student is cheating. Um, they don't have the person's permission to use their work and they're passing it off as their own. That's both. This, uh, this category here, this is plagiarism alone. It's not copyright infringement. If you have the permission of the person uh, whose work you're copying. So, so um, some of us are aware that there are illicit sites where people can buy um, you know, term papers and those sorts of things. And if you, if a student were to go do that um, and pay, you know, some money for somebody else's term paper, obviously they have that person's permission. The person knows that their term paper is being used and they're granting permission for it to be used. It's not an act of copyright infringement, but it's certainly academically dishonest and it's and it's an act of plagiarism if, if the, the student is trying to pass it off as their own work. Uh, this category relates to work where you you are giving credit to the source, right? You're you're not saying, hey, this is um, somebody else's. Uh, you are saying this this is somebody else's work. It's not mine, but you don't actually get their permission. This might be the most common thing that we encounter. So if you, for example, you may have seen on YouTube where people upload their cat video or whatever, and it has some very famous. Uh, pop song as the ba uh, the background and they might make a note no copyright infringement intended well um the truth is nobody was fooled we, we didn't think that you were taylor swift you know uh that you were trying to pass off taylor swift music as your own um we we all know that that's her music um and so <laughs> yeah um, it's not a plagiarism situation uh but it you just saying that you didn't intend copyright infringement does not mean that you got the right permissions to use that music in your cat video 
the main takeaway from all this is that when you give credit, a lot of people think, oh, it's fine if I put in a footnote that I, where the source where I got the work, um, and that is not anywhere close to the same thing as securing the permission to use that work. Okay, so, so giving attribution is good. It's definitely a good thing, and you should do it to avoid plagiarism, but it is not the same thing as securing a license and getting permission from a copyright standpoint. Okay, so uh, here's a local case in Utah that illustrates this point. Um, this one involved a, a graduate student, Esther Israel, at the University of Utah. And basically, she alleged that she did a bunch of work. She had a, a, a lot of original research that were stored on some university computers, and then she was denied access to the computers, and some students, a, a faculty member and some students went on to publish her materials without her permission and trying to pass it off as their own work. They didn't give her credit and they didn't have her permission. So she filed a lawsuit in which she alleged both that um, uh, this was plagiarism. Now the court is not going to rule, uh, plagiarism is not a cause of action that's recognized under United States law, so the court it won't rule on that. She could raise the plagiarism claim with the Honor Code Office at the University of Utah if she wanted to. But uh, as far as the copyright claim, uh, she's pursuing that in, in court, or she was pursuing it. Uh, the court in this instance dismissed the case because uh, the University of Utah is a public institution, and in general, public institutions are immune from copyright infringement lawsuits. So she may have a, uh, a claim against the individual faculty member or st her fellow students, her classmates, um, and it's it, there's a question as to whether or not any of those people would be uh, immune from the suit, but the university, as the university, uh, was deemed to be immune from this lawsuit. Okay, uh, ownership uh, questions uh, often arise with student-authored works. So here are the general principles that relate to copyright ownership, and then we'll see how it applies in this context. Copyright initially goes to the author of the work. Whoever fixes the work in the tangible medium, they own the copyright. If it's a joint work where you have multiple authors, then they jointly own the work. And the way they jointly own it is everybody has an undivided interest in the whole. So for example, um, if, if um, I lived in a duplex where I owned the left half of the house and somebody else independently owned the right half of the of the duplex, um, then we would be joint owners of a structure, but but it would be divided. I could sell my half of the duplex separately um, than the person, whoever my neighbor is, that, that shares the other half of the house. On the other hand, um, if you're married and you and your spouse jointly own a house together, uh, then you... Uh, one of you cannot sell the house out from the other one, or it's not its not a situation where you own the upstairs and your spouse owns the downstairs or vice versa. Um, you share the work as a whole. The same, same basic principle applies in the, work, uh, in the world of copyright. So when you have three or four authors or more, um, all of them have an undivided interest in the whole. They don't, it's not, we don't divide it up and say, well, you just wrote the first few paragraphs, so that's your part. Um, no, they, if, if your name is listed on the, on the authorship form, then you get uh, an undivided interest in the whole. Um, I, I'm spending a little bit of time on that only because we see that come up so often uh, where you have uh, multiple people collaborating together on projects in a university setting. So sorting out um, who owns it and what all of the individual joint owners can do with their work, that's, that's, that can be a pretty tricky issue for, for those of us in university settings. Uh, works made for hire. Um, employers generally are considered the authors um, of any work made by their employees in the course of their employment. Uh, but in the case of universities, uh, BYU and, and most other universities um, that I am aware of have uh, policies in place that uh, grant to both faculty and students copyright ownership over what I'm saying here, traditional academic work. So things like theses and dissertations, um, peer-reviewed articles that are published in academic journals, those kinds of things. Generally, uh, universities do not take an ownership interest in those, even though uh, they may be considered works made for hire if the um, you know, if the student or the faculty member is an employee of the university. 
All right, registration is another important topic um, that comes up. You don't, as we've discussed, you don't have to register your work in order for it to be protected by copyright. The copyright exists at the moment. The work is fixed in a tangible medium. But if you register your work, um, you get certain additional benefits, the first of which is you, you can't file a lawsuit until your work is registered. It's a, it's a requirement. Um, uh, the Copyright Office website is notoriously uh, outdated and cumbersome, but that's the, the one and only option. There aren't, um, aren't competitors. So if you want to register your work, you have to go to copyright.gov and, and go through that process. And then here are the benefits. They're listed there. You get um, evidentiary benefits in court. You get statutory damages um, if your registration precedes the infringement. Um, and you're, so you don't have to prove your actual damages. Um, okay, so here we are with our next case study. This one is an interesting case involving a graduate student who uh, was studying architecture at the College of Architecture at the Illinois Institute of Technology. And uh, the thesis design there you see on the left, that, that's what um, the student came up with. And he alleges in his complaint that that his advisor, his thesis advisor, was a partner in the architectural firm that designed One World Trade Center, which you see there on the right. So he um, he is suing the firm, um, the architectural firm that took credit for designing One World Trade Center and is claiming that he should get uh, credit for designing that building. Um, what's interesting, again, the reason I highlighted this case is because uh, it's it's a very, very common fact pattern where you have advisors, faculty advisors and students working together on a thesis, and there can be some confusion as to who is the author and who is the um, you know, whether the advisor should be listed as, as a joint author. Uh, those are all things that you're going to have to navigate. But I think this case uh, highlights where if it's not clear um, either under your university policies or by some express agreement between all the parties, then it can be, it be fairly confusing. Another reason I wanted to highlight this case is because it, it uh, if you remember back to our categories of copyrightable works, this is an architectural uh, work. Um, which is one of the less common uh, categories of works that we see, but but the case highlights that it's an important category and and absolutely eligible for copyright protection. Also, the uh, what's going on in this case right now, actually, there's been a motion to dismiss that's been pending for quite some time, and what's happening is the uh, the architectural firm is arguing. Uh, this, as you can see, the case was filed in, in 2017, and as you may know, One World Trade Center uh, was a very, uh, this is the building that sits on the site of Ground Zero in New York City. Um, that was, a, you know, one of the most famous building projects in the world, and it was very, very well publicized throughout. So their defense, their argument is that there's a three-year statute of limitations in copyright. You have to bring your claim within three years of when the act of infringement occurs. And so they're saying, hey, this student who developed the thesis back in the late 90s had ample opportunity to bring a complaint long before 2017. And, and so the statute of limitations has run and this claim should be time barred. Um, the student's response is, well, the claim didn't mature until the building was actually built uh, and construction completed in 2014. And so he filed within the three year limitation by filing within 2017. So I think it highlights uh, both an interesting joint ownership question and also when the act of infringement occurs. In the case of architectural works, the court, as I said, has not decided that case yet. It'll be an interesting um, opinion. We'll be watching for it. Um, but if the act of infringement you know, do we have to wait until the building is built and that's when the reproduction has occurred or the adaptation? If you think back to those uh, six exclusive rights, which are the exclusive rights that were being infringed here or allegedly infringed? And so that's the reason I wanted to cover those copyright basics is so if you have those basic principles in mind when when issues arise on your own campus, you can walk through them and see, okay, is there a reproduction happening here? Is there a distribution? What Which are the different rights that could possibly be in play? 
um, and I think this case highlights that well. Okay, uh, I, I want to be sure to leave time for questions, so we'll we'll uh, accelerate here. Uh, Creative Commons is very very important. This is um, I, I presume most of you are familiar with this. Uh, it's a nonprofit organization that gives these simple form license agreements that are widely available for folks who are not interested in commercializing their works. Here's your life hack. Uh, if you're looking, I, I, this is a screenshot of looking for a mountain. If, if, uh, if we have any students who are listening in and are wondering how, how can I get copyright free images that I don't have to worry about, uh, you know, Creative Commons has partnered with uh, Google and other search engines and made it very, very easy. As you can see here, um, if you go to the, when you're doing a Google image search, uh, you can tag uh, for things that are labeled for non-commercial reuse. That's a Creative Commons label. And, and then it filters the search results. So all these images that you're seeing on the screen now, those are all ones that the photographer has has essentially indicated are licensable um, through Creative Commons. So if you if you have to have Ansel Adams photo of Half Dome, that's one thing. I, I mean, that's a different issue. But if you just need a generic photo of a mountain, um, Creative Commons is a great, great tool uh, for helping you with that. When you're giving attribution for somebody else's work, uh, most Creative Commons licenses require that you give attribution, and the acronym here to remember is TASL. So you want to give the title of the work, the, its author, the source from which you obtained it, and the license that goes with it. Um, and the the final piece here is, again, for any student authors we may have uh, listening in, um, if we've been talking mostly about incorporating third party works into your material, um, but if if you want to assert copyright in the output in, in your own thesis or in, in any of the research that you've done, uh, just remember that it's there's only a very thin layer, as we saw in the in the Hovey Taflove case, um, a thin layer at best of of copyright that might protect any uh, data that you collect, any research. And so you may want to consider just uh, licensing out your work and making it clear to everybody downstream from you um, that that you're OK with them using it under a Creative Commons license. OK, there are important exemptions that apply, especially for university users. Um, the librarians uh, hopefully are familiar with the exemptions that relate to preservation copies and, and interlibrary loan and so forth. Uh, for any that we have that might be um, in an instruction situation when you're uh, performing or displaying works, for example, in this webinar, uh, all the, the images that are being displayed uh, um, are covered under either the face to face classroom teaching exemption or the teach act exemption where we're displaying these works in the course of um, distance education. Uh, of course, no discussion of copyright is complete without talking about fair use. Uh, a very, very important, you can think of it as a catch-all exemption, that if, if one of the other specifically enumerated exemptions doesn't apply, then fair use probably applies. Um, and fair use uh, generally deals with uh, these, these uh, preferred categories of use, like criticism and comment and news report reporting, but you can see their scholarship and research are both included. Uh, so Congress specifically recognized the work that we do at universities um, as being preferred uses. Now, that doesn't mean that everything we do isn't automatically fair use. There are four factors that you have to consider. We use the acronym PAIN here uh, because fair use can be a little bit of a pain. Um, but it's the first is the purpose and character of the use, the amount and substantiality of the portion used in relation to the copyrighted work as a whole, the impact of your use on the market, or potential uh, market for the work and the, the nature of the work itself. So um, you have to consider all four of these factors together. Um, and after evaluating all four factors, you can consider whether or not your particular use qualifies as fair use. So to illustrate this, here are a couple of specific use cases. So this case, Reiner v. Nishimori, Reiner is the photographer of the photo there on the left, uh, Exhibit A. Um, Nishimori was a student. Um, an advertising student who used the photo in this mock advertisement shown there. This was not an actual Dr. Scholl's ad. She was 
this was a class assignment basically where she used the photo to make a mock ad for Dr. Scholes and the photographer um, saw this in the student's online um, portfolio and filed a lawsuit against the student and the and the institution actually. So the defense in this case was, well, this was a fair use. The, the, the student did not have the right permissions, did not get an express copyright license. So if we go through those four pain factors, the purpose and character of the use, it's a nonprofit educational use, it's preferred under the statute. So, so that uh, factor would weigh in, in favor of the student. The amount and substantiality of the portion used, well, this is pretty much the entire work, as you can see, that was used in Exhibit C. So, you know, in cases where you're using almost 100% of the work, that's going to weigh against the student. Uh, the impact on the market, um, th there was some dispute about this, uh, but the court ultimately held that uh, a de minimis use at a university was not going to significantly impact the licensing revenue that a uh, um, a photographer might expect for this kind of a use. And then the nature of the work itself, um, this photograph is a highly creative work, which is, uh, that's a factor that would favor the photographer in this case. So uh, if you go through those four factors, you've got two that favor the student and two that favor the photographer. And, and um, ultimately the court held this was a fair use. Um, Here's another case. This one involved um, the juxtaposition of these two photos there. The one on the right is um, is a U.S. government work um, taken by a military photographer at Iwo Jima in World War II. The one on the left is a private, that's a copyrighted photo um, taken on 9-11, or maybe it was the, the day after 9-11, but, um, you know, that's that's the flag uh, at the World Trade Center in the in the debris after the, the events of 9-11. And so uh, Janine Pirro, who is a Fox News host, uh, juxtaposed these two images and put out some social media posts to promote uh, her program. And the photographer of the 9-11 photo there on the left, well, the New, New Jersey Media Group, which owned the copyright in that photo, sued uh, Pirro and Fox News. And again, if you went through the pain analysis in this instance, you, you don't have a university use um, and the court, after going through the factors, said, no, this one does not qualify as fair use. So even though, again, backing up, it, it, you're using a photo um, in both of these cases. In the first case, it qualifies as fair use. In the second, it does not. You have to go through all four factors on a, and do it on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay, last topic here has to do with dig digitization projects. I know that's probably the thing that's of most interest to this group. So the questions that remain are, are the pre-1978 theses and dissertations in your, uh, maybe your special collections, are those in the public domain? The reason they might be is because if they're considered published under the 1909 Act um, and they fail to have a copyright notice on them or they weren't uh, registered, then publishing a work without those formalities before 1978 uh, dedicated your work to the public domain. So you're going to have to do your own analysis. Um, here at BYU, we've looked pretty carefully at that issue, um, and I'm not going to divulge what we've concluded, but um, it's it's something you've got to, every, I've compared notes with copyright folks at a bunch of other universities, and it really does vary uh, across universities. So you should talk with your general counsel's office and decide whether or not you think, but it's a good question to ask whether your pre-78 the theses might be in the public domain. If they are, then you, you're free to, to digitize them and publish them like you would any other public domain work. Um, if they're not in the public domain, maybe you have some kind of an implied license, you know, from your students who were, uh, you know, anybody who's submitting ETDs now, of course, they're expressly granting permissions, at least I hope they are, to to your university to publish and distribute and use the works however you want to. But um, the students who uh, were submitting the, those theses and dissertations before your your current ETD process were, were in place, were they impliedly giving a license to the university? There's a good chance they were. Um, but again, that's something you're going to have to work out with your general counsel's office. And if it's neither of those, is it a fair use because you're a nonprofit educational institution? So that's the last case I want to highlight. That's Diversity v. Schmidley. Uh, this is the University of New Mexico where they did exactly that. They, um, they digitized a, a thesis or dissertation, excuse me, without the student author's permission. And then they argued 
that it was fair use and the court went through the analysis. And even though the University of New Mexico is a nonprofit educational institution, um, when it applied all four of the factors, the court held no, that was not a fair use of that student's uh, dissertation. So th it's a good, good reminder for us. I think a lot of us at universities tend to think, well, we're nonprofit educational institutions. We can pretty much do whatever we want. And um, and this case highlights that, no, it's not always going to be fair use uh, for us to to use our students' works in this way. OK, the last little bit before I open it up for questions, just to, uh, my shameless plug, um, because our office, we deal with these issues all the time. We have uh, really quite a few resources that you might find of interest. Our, our website has a, a wealth of information that I highly recommend for you. We publish a blog. Um, so we're regularly tracking any cases involving universities. Um, uh, so all the cases that you've seen highlighted here, a lot of those have been featured on our blog. So if you want to stay up to date on this, you can you know, subscribe to our blog. We have a podcast that we do. Um, and so you, if you're a podcaster type person, you can subscribe to that. We always welcome listeners there. Uh, once a year in the fall, we do a big symposium um, where we have a few hundred people come. And this is law professors. If you want to take a nice deep dive into these topics, um, it's a it's a two day event that we do. And in the fall in Utah is gorgeous. So uh, last year we had J. Scott Evans as our keynote. Um, we've we've had the general counsel of the U.S. Copyright Office come out and and you know other uh, really good uh, keynote speakers. It's it's a really good agenda. So if you want to put it on your calendar to come out here in October, um, we'd love to see you there. We have a free online tutorial um, and a free interactive decision trail to help you make informed copyright decisions. Again, all these links are, are there for your future reference. And with that, I will open it up for questions. Well, thanks so much, Peter. That was fantastic. Great information. Um, we don't have any questions entered into the chat, um, but we at this time, we want to welcome you uh, type it in. I'm going to go back to the screen here. Just click on the screen and click on this blue chat bubble to enter in your questions. I guess while people are uh, typing in, I'll, oh, here comes one. The question is, would a university policy of submitting an, a circulating an archive to the library make a difference in a case like the UNM one? Let me see. Let me reread that. Yeah. So if the university had a policy of ha a circulating copy and an archived copy, uh, if that was the university policy, would that make any difference? They have one copy that checks out and another one that's archived. Oh, um, boy, that's that's interesting. Um, I, I the facts of this case um, are probably um, well. I I mean they're they're probably fairly common, but they're they are a little peculiar because. Um, you know, this case, like the like the University of Utah case, involved a, a graduate student who had a falling out with with the institution. Um, so I don't know if it was the university policy. Um, I mean, I I'd have to go back. I I, I don't know the the details of UNM's um, uh, policies, but I I don't know that a university policy would have. Um, would have really addressed this issue. And that's, I, uh, as a broader point, I think that's important that um, when you're looking at the question, for example, if, you, if you're if you considering digitizing a bunch of your pre-1978 theses, this is, this is a big, big topic among university copyright people. Um, one way of looking at that, at that issue is from a copyright standpoint, and a different way is from an alumni relations standpoint. <laughs> um, and those, of course, are totally different ways of looking at it. And so even if you feel like legally we can do this, whether you should do it, um, I mean, I know a number of institutions that have concluded our policies allow us to do this. We feel like the law allows us to do this, but as a matter of preserving good relations with our alumni, we're not going to do it. Um, and so I suspect as a practical matter, that was go that's what was going on in the UNM case is, 
you know, once you've had a falling out with a former student or faculty member or whatever, um, the, the chances go up exponentially that you're going to have some kind of dispute and the policy, um, I don't know that a, a particular policy uh, would, would make all that much of a difference. Oh, okay, got another question. Could you speak to permissions regarding retrospectively digitizing undergraduate theses in light of FERPA and other privacy issues? Oh, very good question. Yeah, those are, um, FERPA is not my area of expertise by any means, but certainly that's uh, that's something you've got to take a careful look at. As I was just saying, there, there are a number of issues you've got to consider before launching an aggressive uh, digitization program. So the copyright issues are one, part of those for sure, and uh, FERPA would be another big, big area. I mean, I, I know for a time, for example, here at BYU, uh, student IDs were the student's social security numbers. I, I would guess a lot of institutions may have had that unfortunate uh, practice once upon a time. And so, you know, obviously digitizing uh, paper that has a student's social security number sitting right there on the front page. That's that you could run into some pretty interesting FERPA issues uh, aside from whether or not, you know, as a technical copyright matter, it's in the public domain. So you, you should definitely evaluate both of those. All righty. Yeah, another question. Are you aware of court cases about transcripts, either for videos or text, and whether those transcripts can be copyrighted? Well, uh, I, I uh, certainly uh, transcripts. I, well, uh, let's see. A, a, a script for a, a movie, for example, is absolutely protectable by copyright. If you mean more of a transcript, like for this webinar, for example, where I'm not reading from a script, but if my words are being transcribed in real time, whether or not copyright protection would exist for that, um, there. Uh, there are some interesting questions around that. So the Martin Luther King, uh, I have a dream speech. There was some interesting copyright litigation going on um, because, you know, people who were recording that speech as it happened um, felt like this was an extemporaneous event and they could transcribe it and publish it. But but the court in that case held no. Dr. King owned the copyright because it was a speech that he had written beforehand. It was a literary work, you know, going back to our categories, it was a literary work that was written beforehand. So, so the case may hinge on whether or not the transcript was prepared ahead of time, or it was, it was something like this webinar that's being captured in real time. In which case it would most likely not be protected by copyright. All right. Anyone have any other questions? We probably got room for one or maybe two more. So the Q&A portion of this webinar will be included in the recording. If, um, if I could, let's see, we have two minutes. If you could just speak real quick, this came up a lot when I used to do format checks for theses, the inclusion of survey instruments in that court case that you spoke to uh, uh, kind of address that, but um, do you have any good practices for those of us reviewing theses and dissertations that include those scales and instruments? Yeah, oh man, <laughs> that is a tough area. Um, so I would just say, um, I, I mean, it's a topic as a copyright guy that kind of drives me crazy because if you'll remember, uh, you know, at the very beginning, we said there are certain categories of work that are expressly excluded from copyright protection, and it includes blank forms. You know, so what does it mean to be a blank form? If, if a series of questions that you ask, um, I mean, that's, I, I would argue, a blank form, and I have argued that. Um, but uh, courts have obviously taken a, a kind of more expansive view of, of what is eligible for copyright protection in that area. So certainly if you you're going to have to do your own risk assessment and maybe this is a good note to end on i i think in too many instances we in the academy are too uh gun shy when it comes to copyright issues not every single copyright holder that emerges from the woodwork and does saber rattling has a valid claim and sometimes it's important for us to draw a line in the sands I, a lot of you may be familiar with the georgia state uh litigation that's been going on against all you know the major publishers for 
more than 10 years now. And I mean, they are millions and millions of dollars in legal fees into that case. And it's an important case for universities. And it's it's really important that they didn't just capitulate. And so, uh, um, you know, I haven't personally had an occasion to, to do that in one of the, those cases, but I, I would urge this group to understand what your fair use rights are, um, know whether or not something is eligible for copyright protection, and don't be afraid to push back in, in appropriate cases if if your own you know general counsel's office and the risk tolerances of your institution can bear it, because you're doing a favor to the the entire higher ed community when you do that. That's a great message to end on. Thanks so much, Peter. Uh, before y'all go, just a couple of notes. We do want to hear feedback from you, so keep an eye out for um, when we send you the recording. We'll be sending you a survey link, so please fill that out and let us know if you want to present a webinar on an aspect of theses and dissertations. Next month, we're going to be inviting Heidi RBC Kelm from the University of Iowa to speak on Beyond the PDF, collecting the next generation of student work. So subscribe to the Texeda listserv uh, to get a heads up on signing up for that session. Also want to plug quickly the Texas Conference on Digital Libraries. That, uh, that conference submission date is in a couple of days. We do welcome theses and dissertation uh, presentations. So keep in mind to submit there. Also, the US ETDA conference and uh, is that submission deadline is coming up on March 15th. So if you're part of this community, we want to hear what you are doing. So consider uh, submitting. Finally, we want to thank again Peter Midgley. Uh, we want to thank Billy Peterson Lugo for uh, and Baylor University for providing the webinar support. Uh, on behalf of the Tuxedo board, we want to thank you for tuning in. Uh, we'll be sending out the slides at the same time at the link as the link to the recording. Keep an eye out for that. It'll probably be a week or so before that information is available. So thanks again, everyone. Thanks, Peter, and uh, we hope you have a great day.